Namaste students. In the previous module, I taught you the structure of human digestive system. Now we'll just have a look at the function of each part of the human digestive system. So you can just have a look and just recollect the different parts of the human digestive system. Now the food is taken through the mouth. Okay, mouth leads to a buccal cavity. Now we'll just go into the functional aspects. Okay. So just like that, you can say, just remember what are the different parts in it. You have teeth and tongue. So what is the function of teeth? Teeth helps in mechanical digestion. Teeth helps in mechanical digestion. So it's a process where particles which are large in size is broken into simpler particles. We call this process as mastication. Okay. What is this done for? A bigger particle, when it is broken into smaller particles, a larger surface area is exposed and the enzymes can act better on it. So understand the importance of chewing. Okay, You have to chew and masticate the food and break it into smaller particles so that a larger surface area is exposed and enzymes can act better on it. So the part inside the buccal cavity which helps in this process of mastication is teeth. Now we'll see another aspect, functional aspect of the buccal cavity which is called as chemical digestion. So the first food is broken down into simpler particles, then some chemicals are acting on it. I hope you remember the three pairs of salivary glands. So these salivary glands secrete saliva. Saliva has got, it's a, it's a mixture, okay? The saliva has got various components. It has got some enzymes, it has got ions in it, mineral ions, it has got mucus in it. It also has a chemical which takes care that no bacteria enters. If any bacteria enters inside, there is a component which takes care of that and kills the bacteria. Now let us see the aspect of digestion. Okay, here, chemical digestion. So saliva secretes, secreted by salivary glands, contains salivary amylase or amylase. You can pronounce it as salivary amylase or amylase. Salivary amylase also has got another term, you can call it as tialin. Salivary amylase or tialin. So you, can, you have to remember this term salivary amylase. Amylase is a general term for carbohydrate digesting enzymes. So saliva is secreted by salivary amylase. What is the function of this salivary amylase? Salivary amylase acts on complex polysaccharide like starch and breaks it into or digests it into simple sugars. So understand anything which is complex cannot be absorbed by a bloodstream. So it has to be broken down into simple substance. For example, starch acted upon by salivary amylase, it's broken down into simple sugar, okay? Now, what is the function of this lysozyme? I told there is a chemical which takes care of, if at all any microbes enter through your food like bacteria, this is antibacterial in nature, it kills off the bacteria. Then, there are some electrolytes or ions also in the saliva, which gives it a proper pH, optimum pH for the enzyme action. That optimum pH is 6.8 like sodium, chloride, potassium, and bicarbonate. These ions or electrolytes are there, which make, gives a balance of the pH, which is 6.8, which is required for the action of the enzyme salivary amylase. Moreover, the mucus in the saliva gives a coating for the food. Imagine if you have to swallow something, if it is coated with mucus, it will be easy for swallowing. So some mucus secretion also is in the saliva, which coats on the food, and makes your process of swallowing easy. So once more children, saliva has got salivary amylase, which is the enzyme. It has got lysozyme, which is a chemical. It's antibacterial in nature. It secretes some electrolytes, which are actually ions, which give the proper pH for the enzyme action. And apart from that, some amount of mucus is also secreted by the saliva, which coats over the food and helps in easy swallowing. Now, functions of esophagus. So right from the mouth, the food has to go to a region called as pharynx and from there it has to go to esophagus. So what is this pharynx? The food from the mouth goes to a chamber called as pharynx. Pharynx already in the respiration chapter you studied is divided into nasopharynx and oropharynx. The two terms clearly gives you an idea what is naso and what is oro. Oropharynx is the region of the pharynx, you know, the mouth leads to that particular region. So whatever food you eat, goes to the same pharynx 
the air which you breathe also goes to the same pharynx. So we can see that it's a common chamber where the foot and air has to crisscross. So what happens, there is every possibility of the food which you eat to go directly into your windpipe or trachea. For that, there is an adaptation. I, I very well know that you studied it. Can anybody tell me what structure closes the opening of the respiratory tract? Yes, opening of glottis. Epiglottis, exactly. So epiglottis is closing the respiratory tract and ensuring that the food is going only into your foot pipe or esophagus. Okay, so it's called as foot pipe or esophagus. So once more, pharynx is divided into two regions, oropharynx and nasopharynx. Whatever you eat goes to the oropharynx part and whatever you breathe, oxygen, a mixture of air, a major component is oxygen, goes to the nas nasopharynx. Okay, so from the pharynx region, the foot is directed to the esophagus. What is the function of esophagus? Esophagus is not having any major, it's having of course a major role, but it's not secreting any enzymes or anything like that. But it shows a very important muscular movement called as peristalsis, okay? So foot is directed down by peristaltic movement. So you may, might be wondering what is this peristaltic movement? It's nothing other than a muscular movement. So the function of esophagus is, it's a tube which brings down the it brings down the foot, okay? So, uh, let us uh, go to a simple experiment. I told you about salivary amylase, okay? We are just taking two test tubes and you are taking in test tube A, starch and saliva. What is saliva having in it? Now you can just tell me, I told you, just now I told you. What is the enzyme? Yes, amylase. So, this is salivary amylase, okay? Salivary amylase. I also told you what's the function of salivary amylase. Amylase will act on the starch, complex polysaccharide. And starch has to get converted into simple sugar. This is the, this is the chemical action, this reaction is going on, okay, simple sugar. So if the enzyme is acting properly at the optimum pH, starch will be converted into simple sugar. Now let us look at test tube A. Test tube A has got starch, and saliva with enzyme, which is given all the optimum conditions. So, will that chemical reaction go on it? Just have a look at that. Okay. So, this is our experimental tube. We call it as a experimental tube. Experimental tube is A here. Okay. And we just set a control for this experiment. Okay. So, the test tube B is a control part of this experiment control tube. So what is the control tube? We just want to compare the enzyme action. So we just take in test tube B, starch, okay, only starch. We are not adding saliva into it. So test tube A is starch plus saliva and test tube B is only starch. We just want to know the enzyme action. So give some time, some 20 minutes or half an hour time for the chemical reaction to go on. And after that, we are adding iodine to test tube A iodine to both test tube A and B. Already you studied in the experiment, photosynthesis experiment, the importance of iodine. What do we use it for? Yeah, starch test. So we just want to know whether the reaction went on. So test tube A which had in it starch plus saliva, we are adding a drop of iodine. So we are expecting the iodine, you know, to turn the solution blue-black because we added starch. So you just give a stir or a shake to the test tube and allow the contents to mix up and get, observe it. This is the observation test tube A. Test tube A which had starch, which we actually expect that starch will turn blue-black with iodine, did not turn blue-black. So it was taking up only the color of the iodine was there. Okay, we will come to the conclusion part of that. Now what about test tube B? Test tube B had only starch. We did not add saliva to that. Okay, test tube B had only starch in it, no saliva. So there's no enzyme in that. Reaction wouldn't have happened. So when we added iron to test tube B, it turned blue-black, which means that starch is intact there. So I hope you understood the role of saliva. Saliva has salivary amylase in it. Salivary amylase acted on starch and converted the starch into simple sugar. No more starch. Then how will it turn blue-black when you add iodine? That is the reason why the test tube A remained to exactly the same color of iron, not blue black. But what about B? In test tube B, 
you had only starch, no saliva. So no reaction. Starch is like that and that. So it turned blue black. So it's, it is blue black. So I hope you understood the role of salivary amylase. Now I told about peristalsis in the esophagus, okay? So in the esophagus, a peristaltic movement is formed. This is how it happens. Peristaltic is a wave of contraction and relaxation. The foot is just passing down like a wave of contraction and relaxation. Just pushed down through this tubular structure. Now you can just have a look at this. You can see exactly how the foot pipe is contracting and the foot is being pushed down as small bolus. We call this bo elevus. It's lubricated with mucus and this muscular movement is pushing down the foot towards the stomach. Okay, now. Now let us move on to the stomach. What is the function of stomach exactly? You know what are the various cells in the stomach? Mucus secreting cells are there, enzyme secreting cells are there and hydrochloric acid secreting cells are there. What is the role of mucus? What is the role of enzyme secreting cells? And what is the role of hydrochloric acid secreting cells? Let us look at the role of enzyme secreting cell. The enzyme secreting cell secretes pepsin. This pepsin is not secreted in an active form. All the enzymes will be secreted in an inactive form. The inactive form of pepsin is pepsinogen. Okay? Pepsinogen. Now, this pepsinogen has to be activated in it to its active form. The active form of pepsinogen is the enzyme which actually acts as a catalyst. So, this conversion happens with the help of hydrochloric acid. So, I, I connected you to what is the importance of hydrochloric acid. The enzyme secreted is pepsin and there is a cell which secretes hydrochloric acid also. The enzyme secreted will be in its inactive form which is called as pepsinogen. You know this pepsinogen has to be converted into its active form pepsin. There comes the role of hydrochloric acid. So one function of hydrochloric acid is it converts inactive form of pepsinogen to pepsin. Only then it can take up its role, pepsin, okay. There is one more function for hydrochloric acid children. Hydrochloric acid also, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, you know, immunity we can say. This kills, if any microbes enters through your food, it takes care of that and kills it. So hydrochloric acid provides a low pH, an acidic pH in the stomach, which takes care of any microbes, if at all, they enter through the food. So one is it activates the enzyme, and the second is it kills the microbes. So I hope you got the function of the hydrochloric acid, two functions, okay? Now let us see the function of okay, hydrochloric acid, I told, mucus. There is one more component called as mucus. Why do we need mucus at all in the stomach? What is mucus doing? See, I told there is something which is of a lower pH acid. Acid has got a tendency to excoriate or damage your lumen of the alimentary canal. It's very strong acid. We can't even imagine a strong acid is there inside a stomach. So what is the function of this acid? I told it. It kills the microbes. It activates the enzyme. But then the same acid can damage the lumen or lining of the stomach. So what happens? The lining of the stomach, this interior region, is coated with mucus. Okay? The mucus forms a layer here and takes care of the wall of the stomach. It's not allowing the acid to excoriate or damage the stomach. So you know mucus is a slimy thing. It just coats up. It forms a layer inside and protects the cell. Okay? Gastric glands. Now, this is heartburn. We have so many times we have heard people telling that heartburn. Heartburn is nothing to do with heart, though we call it as heartburn. It's a layman's language, heartburn. But actually, what is heartburn? In the structure you study, there is a sphincter here, okay? This is called as gastroesophageal sphincter. That is supposed to close. It opens and closes. When is it opening? It opens and allows the bolus or the foot to come down. You can see here, the bolus of foot is coming down. And then it immediately closes. And you know, here in this part, there is HCL, okay? Hydrochloric acid. This is a healthy person's stomach. Now, this is a person who's having that so-called, you know, heartburn. What is heartburn? Heartburn is actually a gastric reflux, which means this gastroesophageal spinster is not doing its work properly. It opens unnecessarily. And the acid which is formed here in the stomach, hydrochloric acid is 
undergoing reflux or it, it's just taking a uh, backward route. It's just going up to the esophagus. Okay, this is called as gastric burn. I mean, um, heart burn. This is called as gastric reflux. So you can feel a kind of uh, you know discomfort in the chest region. So we call it as uh, heart burn. So I'll tell you once more. It is a gastric reflux or it's a reflux of the acid. Acid is going back to the from the uh, stomach. It's going back to the esophagus in the chest region. Now, the largest gland, liver. What is the function of liver? Can you uh, just imagine this largest gland which is very important. It's not secreting any enzyme. We just can't imagine. Then how is it important in the process of digestion, children? You are telling it's very important. It's not secreting any enzyme. What may be its function? Its function is emulsification or it emulsifies food. In chemistry class, you would have studied what is emulsification. Emulsification is a chemical reaction where a bigger molecule is broken into smaller components. Anyway, something which is big is broken into smaller components, it increases the surface area. So here again, the function is it increases the surface area. So bigger fat molecules here, a bigger fat molecule is broken into many small components of fat droplets. This, this process is called as emulsification. Why is emulsification required? So that the fat digesting enzymes can act better on it. It gets a larger surface area. So understand there's no any enzyme, rather there are some salt, there are some salts in the secretion of the liver, which is called as bile. Understand the secretion is called as bile. So it secretes something called as bile, which is not having any enzyme, but it's having several salt. These salts are actually helping in the process of emulsification. Okay. Now, what else is the function of liver? Is it doing something, some other extra functions? Yeah, definitely it's a structure, it's an organ which helps in detoxification. If any toxicants enter our body, the blood circulation, it takes this to the liver and it's detoxifying. That is another very important function of liver, okay? Now, what happens to the bile? It's secreted in the liver and it's directly poured into the duodenum? No, okay. Where is it stored? It's stored in a structure called as gallbladder, okay? It's stored in a structure called as gallbladder. So gallbladder is another small muscular structure which is temporarily storing bile. It's secreted from the liver, it's stored in the gallbladder. As and when it's required, it's poured into the duodenum. Now let us move on to another important organ or a gland that is pancreas. Something worth talking about pancreas. You know, uh, what is diabetes? It's very common now, okay? Now diabetes actually is a disorder when pancreas is not working properly. So apart from digestion, pancreas has got one more role. It secretes out certain hormones. The hormones secreted by pancreas are insulin and glucagon. Insulin and glucagon. <coughs> In your blood, if sugar is excess, what happens? The kidney filters it. It's passed out to the urine. This is called as diabetes. And ex anything excess in your body is not good. So what happens is your body has got an intrinsic mechanism which takes care of that. It, it removes the excess sugar, glucose and keeps a balance on that. That is done by insulin. So insulin is secreted by few cells of the pancreas. Insulin is secreted by few cells of the pancreas and it removes the glucose from the blood. Okay? So children, understand what is the role of insulin? Pancreas has got few cells which are secreting insulin and insulin is removing the excess sugar and keeping a person healthy. If insulin is not secreted by pancreas and the level of glucose, the amount of glucose is more in the blood, we can say that person is diabetic. Now this is not at all a part of digestion. Digestion or the digestive process of the pancreas is actually taken care by few other cells. So those cells are secreting out pancreatic juice, okay? Pancreatic juice. This pancreatic juice contains few enzymes in it. What are those enzymes? Trypsin, which is a protein digesting enzyme. Protein digesting enzyme. It has got lipase or lipase. Lipases are fat digesting enzyme. And again, amylase, pancreatic amylase. We call it as 
pancreatic amylase. Okay, amylase already you saw, salivary amylase. Same function. But now because the source is pancrea, the source of secretion is pancrea, we have to discriminate it. Okay, this is pancreatic amylase. So what are the three hormones? A protein digesting enzyme called as trypsin and a fat digesting enzyme called as lipase and a carbohydrate digesting enzyme called as pancreatic amylase. Now here, proteins are partially digested by trypsin into smaller components. I wrote here dipeptides. Dipeptide is nothing. It's two amino acids joined together. Amino acids. Two amino acids joined together we call it as dipeptide. Okay. So dipeptides are two amino acids joined together. So here protein is partially digested by the trypsin and it's converted into a simple product. You can just understand it as simple product. Lipases break down emulsified fat. You remember the role of liver in emulsification? Breaking bigger fat into smaller components. When that is done, the lipase can act better on this emulsified fat. Then pancreatic amylase digests starch into simple sugar. So this is the function of pancrea. Okay. Now one more function is there for the pancrea. The food which is coming down from the stomach will be acidic. So pancrea pours out some bicarbonate ions and neutralizes it. Because acidic food when it comes to intestine, the intestinal juice which contains several enzymes will find difficulty to act in that acidic pH. So the pancreas also releases some bicarbonate ions and neutralizes and brings it to slightly alkaline pH so that the intestinal enzymes can better act on it. Now come to small intestine. Already you know this is the largest part, longest part of the small intestine. Intestine also on its walls there are several glands. We call it as intestinal glands and the secretion is called as intestinal juice which contains enzymes. And these enzymes again complete the process of digestion. So which part of the human alimentary canal completes the process of digestion? It is small intestine. Okay, it happens in small intestine. Now here there are so many other enzymes which are acting on this partially digested food which comes down from the stomach, the different parts and then here it's completing and it's broken down to simplest unit. So that is the function of small intestine, one function of small intestine. It completes the process of digestion. The second function is, we have some special structures, I hope you remember, called as intestinal villi, finger-like projections, which is richly supplied with blood capillaries and a lymphatic vessel. Can you tell me the name of that lymphatic vessel? Yes, lacteals, okay. So the intestinal villi has got all these adaptations, structural adaptations. So all the digested food is absorbed into the villi, into the bloodstream and into the lymph of the intestinal villi. So two functions. One is complete digestion and the next second one is absorption of the digested food into the blood vessels and the lymph of the villi. Now this is the diagram which I showed you when I taught you the structure. You might be thinking why again ma'am is showing here. This is there I taught you the structure. Here I just want to tell you something more about the length of the intestine. Here you can find carnivore and a herbivore. I just told you herbivores have a longer intestine but nobody asked me why and I also didn't say. So now let me brief you what is the function of this long small intestine in the herbivore. So small intestine in the herbivore is long because what is the diet of herbivore? Yes, more of grass, green straw, whatever grass you can say. And what is the major component in the grass? Plant cell, cellulose. Okay, cellulose. Cell wall is made of cellulose. So they have a large amount of cellulose in their diet. What about a carnivore? The diet of a carnivore is a mixture of meat and you know plant diet, everything. So they also consume cellulose, but more of cellulose is consumed by a herbivore. Now you can understand the digestion of cellulose is a time-consuming process. It requires a lot of time, okay? And when it requires a lot of time, and the food has to be retained in the elementary canal for a longer time. So it's a difficult process, a time-consuming process. That is the reason why. The, the herbivores have a longer small intestine. So cellulose digestion is not very easy. It's a time consuming process. So they have a longer small intestine to retain the food there for a longer time. What about the carnivore? Carnivore has got comparatively a smaller small intestine. We cannot say, we cannot say small intestine is smaller, but comparatively it is shorter or smaller, we can say. This is because their diet has got a lot of meat. Meat digestion is not very difficult as compared to cellulose digestion. So they do not need a longer small intestine. So I can ask you a question, why is the small intestine of a herbivore longer? 
Okay? Done. Now, we'll just go into the actual chemistry of digestion. It's just a summary of what you study. Macromolecules, all the components which you take, okay? Intake, in ingestion. So, they have carbohydrates. These carbohydrates are acted upon by amylase right from the mouth. In the mouth, 30% of the starch digestion takes place. Only 30%. Just at least you can say 30% happens. Imagine you are rushing up to school. Your mother gives you something, some roti, chapati or uh, idli or something. You are just chewing it and running off. You can just understand what is the importance of chewing or masticating. When you are chewing the food, it's broken into smaller components. And you are giving some time for the saliva to act on it. Okay, it's mixing and digestion has to take place. If you just chew, if you just swallow without chewing, understand that 30 percent of the carbohydrate digestion is not taking place in your mouth. Understand a little bit. So carbohydrates, amylase acts on it and converts into simple sugar. Next, proteins. Proteins, I, I brought a term here, protease. Can you name the protease? Protease in the stomach. Yes, tell me what's the protease in the stomach? Anybody? Pepsin. And what is the protease in your intestine? It's of course produced by the pancreas. Trypsin. Okay. So pepsin and trypsin are the protease, protein digesting enzyme. So proteins are, and there are several other uh, protein digesting enzyme in the alimentary canal also. So finally, in the small intestine, it is converted into simplest product, amino acid. I told you that is the part where the digestion is completed. Then comes fat. Fat is acted upon by, emulsified fat is acted upon by lipase or lipase and it's converted into fatty acid and glycerol. So all these are the simplest products of digestion. This is happening in the small intestine and where it can be absorbed. Now large intestine. What is the role of large intestine? Because we almost completed all this digestion, absorption. Then you might be thinking, what is the use of this part? This part also has got an important role. I told you, cecum part has got very useful, you know, friendly microbes, symbiotic microbes. It's of course helping us. Then this colon helps in absorption of water, minerals and any important drugs, health saving drugs, we take some medicines and all. So that also can be absorbed here. So here a large amount of water, water absorption would have already happened. But still if at all some water is there, it can be absorbed. Mineral ions can be absorbed. And if any medicinal drugs or anything which we consume also is absorbed here. And also the undigested waste product remnants are coated with mucus. It's coated with mucus and it's converted into fecal matter or feces. Whatever is required is absorbed by a bloodstream and unwanted fibers and whatever is there left out is coated with mucus and it's converted into fecal matter. That is one function. Next, water, minerals and drugs are absorbed here. And we also know in this part is harboring some microbes which are really useful for us. Now, see, you can see it's a scary image. Teeth is really afraid of something. What might be that? Can you just tell me? You all eat a lot of chocolates and you never rinse your mouth. You won't brush your teeth. How many of you brush daily morning and evening? Okay. If you don't do that, you have to do that. Now we are going to see something important. Something about your personal hygiene. So here, after eating, if you're not rinsing your mouth, let it be a chocolate or whatever it is, it just gets stuck onto your tooth. Do you know... Can you just tell me somebody, what is the hardest part of your body? Bone? No. We have something which is harder than that, which is covering your teeth and that's called as enamel. Okay? So enamel is the hardest part of your body, harder than bone. We can't imagine. Okay? We think bone is very hard. Nobody can break it. So that is the hardest part. Enamel is the hardest part. So your teeth, this pearly like structure is actually covered by a very protective layer called as enamel, which is very hardest. Now, what happens is, if you're not rinsing your mouth, the bacteria starts, you know, uh, settling on top of the food particles left on your tooth. And they start utilizing the leftover carbohydrates or whatever it is, and they release out some acids in this process. Bacteria is trying to utilize the food particle left over, and they start releasing some acid. The leftover bacteria, food particle, and the acid together form something called as plague, okay? P-L-A-Q-U-E. P-L-A-Q-U-E. Plague formation. Plague hardens and forms a tartar, a structure on the surface of your tooth. At this stage and all, you won't understand anything, it won't be painful. So after eating chocolate and some carbohydrate rich food, if you're not rinsing your mouth, brushing your teeth, what happens children? The food, all this food left over will deposit on the teeth. Okay? So bacteria 
likes to feed on that. So they feed on this and in this process they release some acid. This acid tries or has a tendency to demineralize the enamel. When enamel is demineralized, one of the protective coat of the teeth is gone. But below that, there's one more protective layer called as dentine. So dentine also tends to protect our teeth. Dentine also slowly gets demineralized by the action of the acid. And this acid invades into the pulp of the tooth. The actual living part of the teeth is the pulp. Pulp has got blood vessels and nerves in it. So here erosion is faster in the dentine because it's softer. But in the enamel, erosion is slow because it's hardest part I told. So once the erosion comes from the enamel down to the dentine, it starts, it, it's quick, okay, it's a fast process. And here also the stage, is, it is slightly painful, okay. And then the acid or the erosion invades the living part of the tooth into the blood vessel and nerves when you really feel it painful. So children, I just would like to tell you the importance of dental hygiene or oral hygiene. You have to do brushing and flossing twice, morning as well as night, okay? Now, th these are the frequently asked questions. Normally, if you see a CBSE paper, board paper, you can find all these questions are repeated. And these are the concepts. So just have a look at this. Why do herbivores have longer small intestine than carnivores? Okay. What is the role of HCL in our stomach? Today I'm not going to discuss the answer here. You have to read the reader and you have to write down the answers, okay? In human elementary canal, name the site of complete digestion of various components of food and explain the process of digestion of carbohydrate, protein and fat. Name the largest gland in our body and explain its role in digestion. Define peristalsis. So read your reader thoroughly, go to the concepts once more and then attempt these questions. Okay students, read the textbook thoroughly, watch the video of peristalsis which I showed you, understand the concepts and then attempt this question. Namaste.